And we are live. Welcome, everyone, to today's edition of The Parlor. And tonight we're going to be uh, focusing on a short story, well, sort of a long short story, actually, almost a novella, called The Truth of Fact, The Truth of Feeling, by the same author that we read a story from on our last parlor. Uh, Alex, do you have any opening statements about this story? So one of the things that I like about this story is it is about the objective versus subjective reality. And I think it goes about saying that the objective reality is more important in a clandestine way. Uh Uh-huh. I think, I, I think that that's, that's true. Um, it certainly uh, places, it, it certainly has like a roundabout way of saying things or a roundabout way of making its point. Um, one thing that struck me was this part that occurs toward the end, and let me pull it up here. Uh, the truth of fact, the truth of feeling. I'll go to the Wikipedia page and find the full text from there. But it's a paragraph toward the end that, um, that I thought was kind of interesting. What he says is, uh, and this isn't at the very end, but it's toward the end. Uh, He says, before a culture adopts the use of writing, when its knowledge is transmitted exclusively through oral means, it can very easily revise its history. It's not intentional, but it is inevitable. Throughout the world, bards and griots have adapted their material to their audiences and thus gradually adjusted the past to suit the needs of the present. The idea that accounts of the past shouldn't change is a product of literate culture's reverence to the written word. Anthropologists will tell you that oral cultures understand the past differently. For for them... Their histories don't need to be accurate so much as they need to validate the community's understanding of itself. So it wouldn't be correct to say that their histories are unreliable. Their histories do what they need to do. Right now, each of us is a private oral culture. We rewrite our pasts to suit our needs and support the story that we tell about ourselves. With our memories, we are all guilty of a Whig interpretation of our personal histories, seeing our former selves as steps toward our glorious present selves. Um... Now, I wanted to pause on this note because I thought this was interesting. Because what he seems to be saying, if I understand him correctly, is that... uh, I'll adjust my camera here. I always seem to have it too low at first. Uh, What he seems to be saying is that literacy decreased the amount of subjectivity in a culture, or decreases the amount of subjectivity. And I don't know if that's really true. Um, in fact, I would say it makes it decreases the amount of subjectivity in terms of the understanding of the past, certainly. But in another sense, it increases it. Uh, you know, I, I would say that Shakespeare and Milton, and you know, even writers like Chang, are all uh, in are are all sort of. Uh, expressing subjectivity or subjectivity is heavily involved in what they do and none of them would be able to do what they do outside of a literate culture yeah you could tell stories but the ability to write fiction or plays or what have you is something unique to literate cultures so you could say that although it shrinks the amount of subjectivity available in the understanding of the past it increases subjectivity in other ways it makes art possible in ways it wasn't possible before So I have to wonder, um, as 
memories of things start to become more uh as more and more of our lives are recorded and surveilled and so forth uh will that not enable subjectivity in some other way you know or or if not in that if not that will will technology not essentially make possible art forms that were never possible before. And then you have an expansion of subjectivity in a different realm. And I think that this is true. I think maybe one reason that art is so stagnant and has been for a long time is that we haven't had a major technological leap in a while. I mean, we've had the information age, but that's, that's kind of building on top of stuff that's been there for decades or even for most of the past century. A really radical, big technological leap is something we haven't had in a while. And I think that once we have that, or once we have a big leap again, art will be fresh once more. That's sort of the impression that I get. I, I'd say that's probably true. Um, I know that when the internet first started being popular, um, there were a lot of people in culture studies who started really focusing on it, and they started noticing um, this completely new uh, way of sharing jokes and ideas and art and the kind of art you would make. The problem was is that for the most part, most people who created for the internet were creating the same forms of art as previously, mm -hmm. just sharing it digitally. The idea is that the um, the delivery system changed, not the art. <laughs> and I because have seen have... some interactive art on the internet that takes you as a you know, a human being and forces you to interact with it, but it's not, but I mean, at the same time, we already had video games, so that's almost exactly the same thing. <laughs> right. And I mean, I guess there's also MMOs, but that's more of a social thing. What we're looking for is, and I think that's kind of what this discussion is starting to circle around is how can the forms of technology that are emerging and have recently emerged, and by recently, I mean, since you and I were born, uh, I'm using a long, long time scale here. Um, how can they enable the creation of new forms of art? And, and you know, it, it, there have been some experimental things that have happened, but none of them have really caught on. One thing I was a big fan of when I was younger were these things called net mazes. There were these sites you could go to, mostly back in the 90s, where you would go to a homepage and there would be a page with a bunch of links and it would be maybe some text maybe an article talking about the author's philosophy but there would be some of the words would be blue hyperlinks pipes they call them on wikipedia and you could click on them and it would take you to another article where they talk a little more about a different aspect and this was and every article was like this and there were dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of these articles in one of these net mazes and you could and and you sort of discovered the body of work not by reading it front to back but by playing with it by exploring it like a maze and i think it's a shame that people have not done that more often um i okay that actually reminds me of something there's a book of short stories by paul tremblay called growing things and one mm -hmm. of them is kind of like that one of the short stories um it's especially helpful if you have a digital copy actually because you could do this like in in the in paper format but it's not quite it doesn't quite have the same oh. aspect and it doesn't work in audiobook format either because you have to make a decision and there are those choose your own adventures but i don't know he does something a little bit different with it it feels like a spiral as opposed to um like a choose your own adventure and there's endings it's it's more uh it, it's it's more like circular like you could go back and forth and back and forth and off to the left and off to the right and just you could swing back to the beginning at any point um that's how that story works and there is no way to really read it chronologically um, so I feel like that works especially well in the digital format because hyperlinks allow you to move back and forth a hell of a lot more than paper does. 
Um, that reminds me of something, actually. I'm going to grab the print book off of my shelf because this is, this is very interesting. Um, Are you here even? Ah, there you are. This is a book that anyone with a background in philosophy will recognize. Spinoza's Ethics. Now, he starts off, um, there are maps of all of the various connections between the different arguments in the ethics, but he says things like, I'll read this. Um, proposition 10, the being of substance does not pertain to the essence of man, or in other words, uh, substance does not constitute the form of man. And he says, demonstration, the being of substance involves necessary existence, Proposition 7, Part 1. The existence of man would necessarily follow from the existence of substance, Definition 2, Part 2, and consequently he would necessarily exist, which, Axiom 1, Part 2, is an absurdity. So every time he refers back to something earlier in the book, it's in parentheses, and if I want to find it, I have to do this. I once found an online copy of The Ethics, and I, I, th I'm glad I own it in print, but I would never use this. You want the online copy of the ethics with the links where you can click and go back and see what the hell he's talking about. It makes reading that text so much easier. And in fact, I think that even though that's a very old way of writing things, it would be great to write things that way these days. It would be a great idea to write things like that and continue writing them now. Because now that we have the internet and you can do these things on computers, books like that would be so much easier to read. So you could have these rigorous demonstrations that refer back to the premises, but 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 they would be much more readable and much much easier to understand. So I think that in terms of like scholar scholarly writing, that could actually be a lot easier. Uh, ditto for being able to click on footnotes and things like that and just see what this is based on. And, and go I've, ahead and I've done that, ahead. and I would say that there is a use for it in fiction, especially sci-fi and fantasy, because they have they tend to have their glossaries and their maps, and I feel like. A reference to a place or a word could, in a digital format, be explained to you by, you know, putting your finger over it and you see it pop up, as opposed to you going all the way to the glossary or the map. I, I feel like that could also be highly utilized in those kinds of uh, writings. Which is interesting, because if you think about it, um, for fantasy, that could be really useful it, uh, in terms of map making. You know, you can have these fantasy maps, uh, and they can work like Google Maps, where you can zoom in and see more detail. And if it gets to a level of detail that's too much for one person to ever do it all, you can have procedural generation. So that... Uh, the level of detail that's too much for you can be automatically made. And if you want to change specific details, like make a person's house look a certain way because they're a main character in one of the books, you could do that. So, so I can think of lots of ways that this could enable art, but for some reason it's not. And, then, and I think actually I know why. I know one big reason why. is because right now we're still at a point in history where this stuff is inaccessible to most people because you have to be a fairly technical person to do it. Um, and I can see two ways around that. One is we make a concerted effort to make stuff easier to use, which we already do, and it is working to some extent. The other is that since people who are adept with this stuff tend to uh, make more money, be more successful, have all the nice things, generally be more uh, desirable as romantic partners, you might see an increase in the number of people who are like that. Uh, and this is that too is already happening to some extent. If you look at 
uh, San Francisco. I forget where I read this. If you press it on me, I won't be able to sketch it out for you because I don't remember where I read it. But apparently there's an unusually high number of children with autism born in Silicon Valley. I wonder why the hell that is. <laughs> because autistic people from all over the world gather in Silicon Valley. So if you look at rates of children diagnosed with autism, they're extremely high in that part of the country because the place is swarming with autistic computer geeks. Um so we basically have created an ecological niche that breeds Aspies, is what we've done. The United States has done this accidentally by fostering the existence of Silicon Valley, and and soon enough, you know, we'll all be ruled by the uh, by the uh, uh, model train collecting master race of Southern California, I guess. <laughs> well, I hope not. That's well, one form of sci-fi. They got their fecal matter problems taken care of, but <laughs> on the front of um, why this is not happening right now is that I kind of feel like to some extent it's because I went through the the master's program for creative writing. They don't they don't teach you, you know, to branch out to uh explore. They teach Barth. Like Barth is one of the people they teach you and he's he's postmodernist, so that is a lot of play with the form, but they don't tell you to use something like technology to your advantage and the publishing houses are not looking for it. Mark Z. Danielewski had to break through to them in like the the first copy of House of Leaves was this dog-eared thing that people passed around until a publisher goes, I want to publish this. Uh like like hundreds of people had already read it, I'm pretty sure. And then uh so Publishing houses don't want to take a risk on something so weird. And then at the same time, uh, they're not teaching writers to be good writers anyway. So it doesn't matter. It's like they're never going to try. They're lazy. They're very lazy. They won't even come up with a plot. So why would they go to the lengths that we're talking about here? Well, this is one place where I think I can see an opening, Alex. Um, cause if you think about it, what is these people's idea of being, uh, of being with it, of being modern and updated and sort of staying with the times? Well, their idea of doing that is being politically correct. It's basically what they think is we, we are staying abreast of the times. We are staying up to date or whatever, as long as we have the right political opinions. And that's it. They, they don't really, uh, Actually, they don't pay much attention to the content of the art at all. Uh, people, you know, the, the the people who run places like publishing houses, other people involved in the literary world, such as journalists, most of the big authors right now, none of them really pay any attention to the content of their work. It's more just, you know, do you have the right opinions? And that's it. So not only is the quality of their product dismal, but they're not taking advantage of technology. So what if there were a group of artists who tried to use technology to make their writing um, more interesting or tried to use technology to create new forms of writing? One thing that I've done, I've done this to some extent with my answers on Quora, and I'm going to start doing it on my sub stack is taking is writing my little bite sized articles of less than a thousand words and linking them together. So it's sort of like the Wikipedia mar model where you have pipes. And if you read the Wikipedia Wikipedia article on, I don't know, on Cortez, it'll say Cortez was a conquistador and conquistador will link to the page on conquistadors. Um, so one thing that I do is I write these little articles, and if a word, you know, if I mention something that I've discussed before, I link back to that other article. So what you get is not a book, not, not a single book organized in a linear fashion, but a book-length set of little bite-sized articles that are all linked together like this big chaotic spider web based on which ones are conceptually relevant to the others. So if you want to get a grip on how I think, you go to, say, my blog or to Quora or wherever, and you just read the articles, and if something looks interesting, if a link looks interesting, you click on it, and then you read that. You don't even have to finish each article you read. You just kind of wander around inside my mind for a while and get a feel for the lay of the land. 
I think that that way of writing is much, well, first of all, it's much more amenable to the digital age. People have trouble sitting down and reading a whole book, which is sad. And I don't think it'll ever fully die out the same way vinyl records never fully died out. I still sit and listen to records partially because they're outdated, but but at the same time, I think that, you know, how do people consume media? They don't sit down and consume one long thing. They don't even sit down and consume an entire movie a lot of the time. They do this. And they scroll and they read lots and lots and lots of these little bite-sized things. So if you make a ton of little bite-sized pieces of writing and link them all together so that people can wander around and scroll and read this, that, and the other thing, I think that that, that fits much better with the character of the digital age. And it's also a way that artistic writing could be done, that fiction could be done. And, you know, you could even go in and out of fiction with your writing, um, link from a nonfiction piece to a little story that you wrote. Um, and people can sort of wander around in that. And I think that that mode of con- because the mode of consumption right now, the way that people consume media is it's not a linear back to front. It's all these little bite-sized chunks, irregularly sized, some long, some short, whatever. And people just kind of go around through the internet and scoop these up like some kind of whale filter feeding or something. Um, And that's something that I have, uh, that's something that I think we should take advantage of. We should adapt to the way that people consume media now and make writing that sort of is that that fits naturally with that mode of consumption that's kind of hard for me to conceptualize i guess because um i read so much like i read like 10 novels at a time and i i i i'm way ahead of my reading schedule at this point and so to me i'm like i could sit there and i could read an entire book in a day and i read slowly so I'm like, I'm, it's hard for me to conceptualize not having that kind of focus, I guess, which I, I, it's, that's makes me weird in this age. Like at this point, if a movie or a TV show doesn't hold my interest and I end up scrolling, it's probably because it is actually bad <laughs> because I can just zero in on stuff, uh, especially stories. So it feels kind of, um, awkward, I guess. And, uh, from my perspective, to think that way, but, um, I'm trying to, to play, though, as a writer. I don't want to just write, you know, boring novels. And one of the reasons why is because I know that people's brains need play, like, a lot. And that does not necessarily mean, like, fun times, but, like, it needs puzzles to work out. And sometimes the puzzle is the story, and sometimes the puzzle is how the story is told. And I, I'm i more interested in the, the latter than I am the former. Okay. I mean, that's that's fair enough. You're saying you don't want to write only for people who are like you, and you do want to adapt. But on the other hand, because you're someone who will actually sit down and read a book, which is apparently a freaking rarity these days, uh... It's hard for you to conceptualize, but I would advance to you that this has always been the case and that there was only one weird pocket in history where it wasn't. In the old days, very few people could read, and those that were were probably people from the uh, upper echelons of society who who Count Choc- who Some guy who called himself Count Chocula told me that he thought that like people from the upper echelons may have had an IQ difference, which, of course, that's horrible and bigoted and not real, but, you know. Um... He also told me apparently that the average IQ of European noble nobility is still around 130, but who knows if that's even true. Was he, The guy's screen name was Count Chocula, for crying out loud. Uh, but anyway, so in the old days, only a few people could read. And as reading became, as literacy spread due to the advent of public schooling and things like that, uh, more people read books for pleasure. But that now that technologies like television and movies and and the internet have come around, 
fewer people read for pleasure. But I would argue that it's just going back to equilibrium. The number of people who are inclined to sit down and read a book for pleasure has always been small. It was just artificially inflated during that one historical period where books, where literacy was really widespread and books were one of the few forms of entertainment. The thing I find kind of funny about that is that book sales are insanely high. Like, really? They, I mean, like every year it seems, I mean, they, they, they're starting to dip down, but they, they did not, they survived the ebook, you know, and the internet, um, like major, uh, publishing houses are still able to put out some pretty good sales on, and there's more books being published. The problem is, I think people are buying books and not reading them. Yes, <laughs> yes, precisely. Uh, I mean, that's a problem I have. I, I, I read books, but I buy them faster than I read them. <laughs> I mean, I swear, I could be homeless and starving if you gave me ten bucks and there's a Barnes and Noble. Don't, don't bet on me buying food. I will do it. I will do it, motherfucker. I will spend that last ten dollars on books. If I can find one book that costs less than that, I'll walk 10 miles to a half price, pass all the fast food places and buy a book and starve while reading that. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway. In all seriousness, I, I, I do think that you have a point. And, and I also, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, print is dead. Nobody buy, is going to buy print books anymore. but. Again, that's like saying that vinyl records are dead. Well, they're outdated. Well, yeah, they're outdated. That's why I buy them. <laughs> they, 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 they underestimate the power of that hipster part of us all that wants to own retro things. And also get an yeah. author's autograph on the book. Like, how are you supposed to do that with an yeah. e-book? It's not the same. Exactly. So I, it's the, not the same. I don't read print books because of how bad my eyesight is. Um, so I, because I like the enlarging the text on my phone and, or computer mm -hmm. to read, but I own so many hardback books and, and paper books because I, I met so many authors over the years and got their autographs on them. Like right before everything went down last year, I was going to buy a book I read in 2019 and because i was about to meet the author at the tucson festival of books and, and i wanted his autograph on it like i'd already read the book <laughs> i had a digital copy but i wanted his autograph i was like gonna go out of my way for it and that's the thing is that i think a lot of people don't realize how awesome it is sometimes to to meet another author or to meet if, even if you're just a reader to meet an author is can be really awesome Yes. Oh, yeah. Getting, getting. Uh, you can't get a, a. You can't get an author's signature on an ebook, or if they can be a digital signature, like who gives a shit? Um, I, I think you know. I, I definitely see the point there, but also, I mean, and there's an ego thing there as well. I like displaying all my books. I like having people come in and seeing the look of fear as they realize that they can never match my intellect. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I die from laughing at my own jokes. I'm the most narcissistic motherfucker in the universe. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, there is an ego thing with displaying books. There is a certain amount of culture that is performative in the books you choose to have out on your shelves. The books you choose to display are... You know, they're, um, they, that, that, that says something about you. What do you choose to show people? Uh, so, go ahead. I don't even own any bookshelves. Everything is just in stacks. <laughs> stacks of books. Everyone can see the spines when they walk through the place. Not that I ever have visitors. <laughs> I was going to say you you know that you you know that you've really got the right amount when your desk is just made from books. It's just like a hay bale worth of books stacked up, and you just you just put your computer on that. You know, when when it when your house looks like yours your your uh, your green screen background there, then you know that would be a dream for me. Whether or not I read dig pr you know print books, it would be nice to be that surrounded by books. 
it, you know, just not, I don't know, there's something great about the feeling of a physical book. I know a lot of people think that, and, like, just being surrounded by the visual idea of so many different concepts and stories, just, you know, it's so, like, comforting, I guess, uh, to see that much human input just surrounding you it's not the same with digital like it's like you get you could possibly see more with digital but it's not the same well you know when people say things like this about vinyl records that you can have this huge album with the enormous album art on it um you know or or you can have like the it, it's a friend of mine has a record that's a symphony from some classical composer and the cover art is just a topless woman holding two skulls that are covering up her boobs i'm like what does that have to do with it well it doesn't have any boob everything's better with boobs i guess um <laughs> but but you can have your vinyl record with the huge art and the insert and everything. And old older people talk about how they pine for those. And younger, and you know, you hear younger people say things like, "Whatever, that's outdated." Well, I, I I'm 31. I own a bunch of them, and that was way before my time. So, so that you know, never underestimate the power of retro hipsterdom. Well, uh, I once I once saw something from a t it was a TED talk about the idea that a technology never dies that you will find a subculture that will continue that technology, whether or not it is adapted by the society at, la at large. So he's like, steam engines. And then he goes and he shows on the internet, you can buy all these steam engine parts and make one yourself. And he's like, it's, it, it's everything. Nothing goes away. Which is kind of great when you think about it. And then with advances in material science and 3D printing, you know, maybe we'll be able to create physical books that we order from the Internet. Uh, that, that would certainly be something. You know, go ahead and just spin one up and your 3D printer makes a nice book for you and you can take that and let the author sign that. You know, it's a. Uh, that's that futuristic thing with the scanner that just like craps out packages at you that you order. You know what I mean? But never mind. You mean a replicator? Yes, a replicator, <laughs> thank you. I am drinking uh, Red's Wicked Apple, and this is an 8%er in a can this size, so I, I think it's hitting. Um, I'm completely sober. I'm just tired. <laughs> good grief, now I'm the one drinking and you're not. That's a, that, that's a bit of an inverse of the ordinary situation here. Well, I'm on antibiotics again, so... <laughs> oh. Oh dear. You poor thing. So, to bring it back to the text a little bit, what did you think? I It has a little bit about Ludditism in it when it comes to uh, the idea of replacing your actual organic memory with a uh, coded one, essentially. And I. I, w I wanted to get your opinion on that, because I felt like you, you would have something interesting to say. Oh, well, let's go ahead and relate that back to the vinyl record thing. What if people had these things where they would sometimes voluntarily disable it? Like, oh, let's do this thing where we go a, a week without our robot memory. Or let's do this special retreat where we all go hang out in the woods for a week and our robot memory is off. You know, what if people did things like that? I you know, imagine if, it would happen. Like, I, I mean, I, that's the thing. I think the story is missing is the subcultures. Uh, I think there would be people who wouldn't have video logs at all. I mean, like he he doesn't really, but like, but because of age, I feel like there would be even young people who would go, "No, I'm not doing this." <laughs> oh yeah, or or people who. Or, or even people who make little communities where they're like, it's not allowed in here. If you, you, if you live here, you can't have one of those, and we won't let you into the gates if you have one. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's an episode of Black Mirror where everybody has a retinal video camera in their eye. It actually st stars Toby Bell um, before he started doing all his um, uh, CGI body work. But he, uh, in it, he clearly has an anxiety disorder because he's constantly reviewing his video vlogs. Constantly. And um, 
what, there's a character in there who had her video log chip stolen from her and she never got a new one. So she doesn't even have one. And at one point she needs to call the police and they won't take her call. Like, because when she calls them and they say, give us access to your video log, your, 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 your retinal camera, so we could see what's going on. And she goes, I don't have one. And they just hung up on her. Wow. Which it's like, well, it's Black Mirror. It's the worst possible scenario you could think of. I mean, I I could see things like that happening, but then again, when things like that are happening now, they're the cause for all kinds of hyperbolic outrage on Twitter, and people get up in arms and they go storm the local high schools and they vote for people they're not supposed to vote for, and so on. Um, so I know and, they, and there's is, always a backlash, and I think that people like in sci-fi especially like ignore that sometimes the idea that there is a backlash to things like you want to act like this will be some new standard idea of society but there's probably going to be a backlash a backlash and then a third movement that is you know that negates both of them some hegelian thing possibly but i see what you're saying is that i and, and i think i can add to that why are they that way i ask myself like why do they underestimate the the forces of reaction and one thing that i can say is that a lot of these sci-fi writers come out of stem they come out of especially software development and IT, but more generally, out of, out of science more generally. Um, and one thing you will notice if you spend time around computer people is that they tend to be impractical or unrealistic in a very particular way. They can be realistic about their day job, you know, writing software, but they can also be very unrealistic. And the way that they're unrealistic is in the assumption that everything works the way software does. Like, well, you know, because of how the abstraction works, if this provides the same services as that, then as far as we're concerned, they're the same thing. We don't care about the implementation. You see, in, in computer science, there's this notion of an abstraction. An abstraction is when you don't care about what's actually going on as long as it, as long as every time you give it the same thing, you get the same thing back. Um, one example of that would be. Uh, one example of that would be, let's say I had a chip, right? And if I apply a current to both of the prods on the chip, then the prod coming out of it, and then a green light lights up. Let's say I have two chips like this. Well, if I open them both up and then the circuitry looks totally different because even though they behave the same, their interiority is different. What a person in computer science would say is that the abstraction is the same, but the implementation is different. The abstraction is the services we can get out of it. The implementation is its interiority, what's going on inside of it, how it's actually put together. Um, and one thing that I think a lot of... IT people miss. Of course, I know some very smart people in IT who actually are very, like, painfully aware of this, and they seem to be frustrated with other IT people who are not aware of it. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, you, you can read his stuff on Quora. His name is Matthew Line A. He's very aware of sort of the uh, blind spots of IT people, and he tries to address them. He's, he's an interesting guy. Um, but anyway, one issue that with STEM people, and you see this especially when they try to do philosophy, is that they don't realize how many assumptions their way of thinking relies on. They're like, well, the abstraction is the same. We don't have to worry about the implementation. It's stop right there. I know that's how it works in virtual machine world. But as soon as you get out there in bumpy, uneven reality land, Shit gets way more complicated. Uh, and this is something that, especially for students, like like students in comp sci and academics in comp sci can be totally unaware of this stuff. The ones in industry are a little more savvy because they have to deal with realities more often. 
But I, I mean, it's very easy to get lost in abstraction land if that is your career. So anyway, the reason I say all that is to say this, is that a lot of sci-fi authors come out of that field or, or, or adjacent fields. And as a result, they tend to have this very abstracted notion of how things work. Uh, and I'm going to shift gears here and bring up, there's a biopic made about the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. It's a movie about his life, but it's a very weird, trippy movie. It's not realistic at all. It involves a little green alien that like represents some part of him. It's weird. But um, I'm, gonna, I'm looking up a passage from it I want to read. And this, I think, applies to a lot of sci-fi authors. Uh, Let me tell you a little story. There was once a young man who dreamed of reducing the world to pure logic. Because he was a very clever young man, he actually managed to do it. And when he'd finished his work... He stood back and admired it. It was beautiful. A world purged of imperfection and indeterminacy. Countless acres of gleaming ice stretching to the horizon. So the clever young man looked around the world he had created and decided to explore it. He took one step forward and fell flat on his back. You see, he had forgotten about friction. The ice was smooth and level and stainless. But you couldn't walk there. So the clever young man sat down and wept bitter tears. But as he grew into a wise old man, he came to understand that roughness and ambiguity aren't imperfections. They're what make the world turn. He wanted to run and dance, and the words and things scattered upon this ground were all battered and tarnished and ambiguous, and the wise old man saw that that was the way things were. But something in him was still homesick for the ice, where everything was radiant and absolute and relentless. Though he had come to like the idea of the rough ground, he couldn't bring himself to live there. So now he was marooned between earth and ice at home and neither, and that was the cause of all his grief. Which is funny because that's kind of like a breaking speech, or the reason you suck speech. Like you're talking down to someone, but it's it's delivered with a certain tenderness that makes it not so bad. Like it, it's very sympathetic to the person it's describing. Which is that, um, is that in the end, it, it sounds like it sounds like a torture, and that and that the bad bad for him. Well, yeah, and you have to feel bad for a guy like Wittgenstein. That guy lit. Eh. I, for a while, when I was in my early 20s, in my fiery, passionate, idealistic days, because I'm totally not over the top and too passionate about things now, um, in my fiery, idealistic days, which totally never ended, uh, I sort of idolized him. I was, I was fascinated by Wittgenstein. I was, I was like, mesmerized by that guy. Uh, and he's a fascinating person, if you read about him. Everybody says he was half crazy. Uh, I don't think he was. I think he just didn't wasn't real good at communicating. Apparently, he would sit in a room when he was a school teacher for a while. He would sit in a room where the schoolmaster was playing the piano and yell Krautsalad, which is the German word for coleslaw. Whenever the schoolmaster's playing the piano, piano he walks in and yells coleslaw. I, I think maybe he was saying that the music was bland. Was it, maybe that was it? I don't know. The thing I find kind of funny about when it, why I was thinking about when you were telling that, which is essentially almost a fable, um, is the idea that something perfect is useless. <laughs> it's beautiful yes. to look at, but it's useless to you. Um, Einstein famously said that insofar as they are precise, the laws of mathematics do not refer to reality, and insofar as they refer to reality, they are not precise. Because it's not, it's not that real that things are not quantifiable or whatever, but it's it's more that there's so many variables, there's so many things, and so many of them are unknown. Some of them are just unknown unknowns. So and or unknowable. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you can't account for everything because you don't know everything, and you don't even know what you don't know. So it's it's impossible, um, and 
to to think that you could means you think you're God or some cosmic yeah, which, being. Which means you're an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> And it's so funny. It's one thing that you know, you know, in Christian sort of I, in in the Christian view of things, if you look at that religion, they think, well, you know, Lucifer is evil because he thinks he's God. He wants to be God. Which, on the one hand, I can see why people who don't like religion would be opposed to that idea. But on the other hand, if you take it out of its religious context and just look at it as sort of an idea on its own, it makes sense. Yeah, people who think they are or want to be God are usually pricks. So, yeah, that, that's that, that's and um, th- this actually reminds me of something that's been on my mind lately. I'm kind of free associating here, but I think I think you'll like this, Alex. Um, there's a guy from the 19th century who was part of this pseudo philosophical movement called anthro- anthroposophy. I think it was Rudolf Steiner might have been him. Steiner, rather. Uh, but it could have been someone else. But anyway. um. <sighs> Anthroposophy. So in this, and it, it's sort of pseudo-philosophical, pseudo-mystical religious. I don't believe in it. Don't worry, I'm not evangelizing for some system here. And it's one of those things that you end up reading about if you spend a lot of time reading about the history of ideas. Eventually, you kind of go down bunny trails and end up in, like, reading about Scientology or Anthroposophy or Islam or Christianity or what have you. You look at religions and, like, self-help gurus and shit. But anyways, he in anthroposophy there was this concept. And the concept is known as uh Arimanic evil versus Luciferian evil. Two kinds of evil. And on the one hand, you have Luciferian evil, which is the Lucifer evil, the proud, vain ambitious, I want to be God kind of evil. But then you have the Aramonic evil, which is more like self-indulgent evil. Like the, I'm going to stuff myself silly, do a few lines of coke, and have a gangbang with hookers and not care who I give this STD to, because it feels better without a condom. Um, so you have your two, like your self-indulgent evil versus your self-glorifying evil. And I, I, I think that which kind of evil a person is prone to says a lot about them as a person. It's funny you saying that it made me think of this thing. Uh, what well, The Lucifer evil sounds like narcissistic personality disorder. And the other one sounds like what I call... Uh, hedonistic personality disorder which is not a real thing (laughs) but part of me thinks it should be because there are some people who are just obsessed with the like dopamine hit you know they're so obsessed with it i'm like and they're like that their whole lives and i'm like how is this not a personality disorder (laughs) i think that it's sort of maybe you could say the narcissistic is the is the sociopath with impulse control Whereas the hedonistic one is a sociopath with no impulse control. I mean, uh, having no impulse control is a diagnostic sign of a sociopath, but I'm actually skeptical of a lot of the things psychology says about sociopaths and psychopaths and so on, because all of their studies are prison-based. I know. All they're starting stuff. to find like that CEOs have a high rate of sociopathy, and that means that their data is skewed towards violent uh sociopaths and it's like that's not really good data then (laughs) and what if there are high functioning sociopaths just like high functioning autistic people or whatever what if there are sociopaths who are like married with kids and they're good not abusive parents well yeah and i just happen to be a well-adapted sociopath and i have seen people kind of like that and i've seen fiction explore the idea um especially um pop fiction and because it's it's totally possible and it's really silly to act as if it's not possible just because you've been looking in one place for the signs of it that's it's it's so dumb it's sort of like oh well all we know about this disease is what hits our hospitals we haven't been looking at people who are getting it and getting well 
Exactly. Like if someone has count choculosis and they're just looking at the people who don't recover from it, it's like, well, what about all the asymptomatic ones? Did you count those? You know, you just, just got to wonder. Um, but another thing that I wanted to say uh, about this is that if you talk to anybody in the natural sciences, go talk to a physicist sometime and ask them what they think of social science. And if they've had enough to drink, to be honest with you, they will not say nice things. And interestingly, they don't apply this to the humanities. I've met physicists who are totally okay with philosophy and history, but think psychology is a load of horse shit because it's pretending to be science. It goes through it too goes many through cultural lenses honestly to be scientific because they found because that, they found that oh these personality oh. disorders don't exist in this kind in this culture and it's like well then that means it's not really a personality disorder what even is a personality disorder at that point and then like but i've seen them make so many arguments about what a personality disorder is they're interesting as a way of codifying horrible behaviors mm -hmm. you know a pattern of horrible behavior is a it, it's a very useful tool in that regard but um when they get to to you know prescription that's when they start really fucking it up uh because you have those who believe well it's a personality disorder that means it can't be fixed and then you have the people who are going i'm it's a sliding scale <laughs> and you can train them to be out of it so it's like Right. They, they can't agree on anything. <laughs> and, and then you have, like, and then you have some that are so culture-bound. Like, if someone believes in things like alien abductions and horoscopes, they might get labeled with a schizotypal personality disorder. Whereas if someone walks into a psychologist's office and goes, I think that 2,000 years ago a woman had a child that was also God, they'd say, oh, well, he's just religious. Like, that's totally culture-bound. And I'm not, th this guy is not hostile to religion at all. I I'm completely okay with religion. It's just that, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be so prescriptive about what people quote-unquote should believe. I don't believe in Bigfoot. I think it's just a bunch of hoaxes, but if somebody does, I don't think they need to get dragged into a psych ward. As long as they can function, who gives a shit, right? As long as they can hold down a job, pay their bills, and raise their kids okay, what, why should I care if they want to go out on the weekends and look for Bigfoot in the woods? It's a hobby. It's a hobby. <laughs> like, I don't believe it, but uh, you, you get joy out of doing this, out of possibly finding information about it. Like, I don't... It, talking about it to other people i don't want to hear about it but you know other people who are also interested want to hear about it and you guys have can be friends and it doesn't have anything to do with me fine <laughs> right although I, I i will say this i it would take a lot to convince me but if one day they did drag one out of the woods i would have to eat my words i don't think that's going to happen i i don't believe in that stuff but if it did i would have to go okay they were right i was wrong I feel the same way about everything that I don't believe in. Uh, and it's funny you brought up Bigfoot because I have a friend who's in Bigfoot conspiracies but doesn't really believe that <laughs> Bigfoot exists. It, it's just like a hobby. I know a lot of people it's, like it's, that. It's fun to read about. Yeah. And discuss. And, and discuss, yeah. And like possible theories and everything. And it's like, I get that. That's That could be enjoyable. And um, But I don't think... Um, yeah, if they if they pulled up like the fossilized remains of some giant uh, erect ape in the you know North America and said, "Look, it's Bigfoot," I would have been like, "All right, I guess they did exist." <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, well, this depends on how you feel the reference of words works. There was a creature in the Pleistocene called Gigantopithecus which was the largest ape that we know of. Now, it, it went extinct thousands and thousands of years ago, but Gigantopithecus was like... Think of, a, think of a gorilla that is the size of five gorillas. Like, this thing was ten feet tall, with arms that reached the ground, and just like this massive ape, the largest primate that, any, that has existed that we know of. Um, now, here's the question. Uh, there's a philosopher named Saul Kripke who raises this question. 
If we found creatures in the ground that look everything like a unicorn and have all the anatomical features of unicorns, would we say, but, but keep in mind, but found out that our word unicorn was based on myths that had nothing to do with those creatures. Does that mean unicorns existed? And he would say no. And that has to do with his philosophy about how reference works, about how words refer to realities. Uh, There's some idea um, to bring it up that a large lizard existed in Europe hundreds of years ago, centuries and centuries ago. Uh, And that's where we get the myth of dragons. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's sort of like how England doesn't really have wolves because they killed all of them. The idea that Europe is one of the first places to really, really spread themselves out and take over nature as much as they did. So there's this, there's an idea that there's a lot of extinct species from centuries ago across Europe, which I find is an interesting idea for all the, the European myths and, you know, cryptozoology. Um, but a lot of this, a lot of, when it, when it comes to, are they here now? Most of my response is no. <laughs> Because of the fact that we, like, almost everyone has a camera on them at all times. <laughs> yeah, that, and that wasn't true a long time ago, and yet nobody ever gets a picture of one. Exactly. Like, I, like, I feel like that disproves their current existence, at the very least. Right, or at least provides extremely strong undercutting evidence. Now, there was one thing I wanted to bring up when you were talking about, like, um about the origins of the myth of dragons. There's another book on that. Hang on one second. I am going to pluck it off the shelf and show it to you as if this is fucking Mr. Rogers show and tell because I'm a dork. Um, there it is. This is by an anthropologist. I believe he's an anthropologist. Uh, Yes, yes, he's an anthropologist, and also uh, the particular subfield is primatologist. Meaning an anthropologist who studies apes and monkeys and so on. And this this book is called, uh, let me open up my camera so I can make sure viewers can see it, An Instinct for Dragons. And in it, he argues that in our evolutionary past, we have had three main predators or primates in general, humans, monkeys, great apes, etc., have had three main predators. And those three main predators have been uh, snakes. Um, Besides snakes, there were also birds of prey, that is, raptors. Not like velociraptors from Jurassic Park, but the word raptor originally means birds of prey, like hawks and eagles. So uh, we have snakes, We have birds of prey, and there was a third one. What was the third one? Oh, and big cats, like leopards, lions, and so on. Well, if you take those three animals, or those three kinds of animals, since those are genera of animals, not specific species, and you combine them, what do you get? You get a dragon. You get a scaly creature with claws, big fangs, and wings you get a dragon. And his argument is that this is why dragons appear in almost every culture and they're always scary and the hero always kills them. Because dragons are just a portmanteau, so to speak, using that word loosely, or or let's say a composite or a shimra of all the creatures that eat primates. Big cats, snakes, and uh, uh, raptors. So, and there is um, there there is evidence. Well, not evidence, but there is speculation that the main predator of humans in the Ice Age, you know, during the Pleistocene, was something called Dinophilus. It was like a saber-toothed cat. It had those long fangs, and the idea was that it would grab a primate from behind, and its fangs would puncture their skull, and that's how it would kill you in one bite. Just which freaked me out because I distinctly remember having a nightmare as a child where there was some beast in my room and I didn't turn around because I didn't want to look at it and it jumped and bit me on the back of the head. And I'm like, oh, fuck, wait, is that why? Was that just like an instinctive fear of mine because I'm a human and 
know, why do little kids dream about monsters and why do we act? That's another thing is I, I kind of speculate, is this a cultural memory? Why is it that when I, there, whenever there's little kids, one of the things that it's considered acceptable to do is to chase them around and act like you're going to eat them. I'm sure we're totally not training them to avoid predators. That's not what we're doing at all. <laughs> I, I, had had a, uh, I read a book mm-hmm. on anxiety disorders recently, and it was based on evolutionary psychology, and it kept bringing up how s- specific anxiety disorders could come from an evolutionary need back when, before we were, you know, in the prehistory. And it was really interesting to, like, think of some of these ideas, like, uh, a fear of wide spaces could come from the idea that, well, a lion could run up and grab you. You have no shelter, you know, and and stuff like that. So I was like, that's a really interesting idea that these are kind of bred into us, that because anxiety disorders are incredibly common. Uh, they're one of the most common uh, forms of like what they consider neuroses. And it's like, well, maybe that's why. <laughs> And also things like ADHD. I've seen theories that ADHD would have made you the most formidable hunter-gatherer there is. Because what is... or Well, I have my own pet theory about this. I think that it's possible that people with ADHD were once sentinels. They were night watch people. And here's my reason for thinking that. Is that, okay, you have a person who is constantly darting their eyes around and looking at anything in sight... And the only thing that ever gets their attention for a prolonged period of time is novelty. And as soon as they find out what it is, they lose interest. That's a sentinel. Well, I looked it up, and I thought, well, that theory would predict that people with ADHD would stay up at night. And I looked it up, and what do you know? ADHD is heavily correlated with insomnia. (laughs) Well, maybe they're supposed to be awake at night because they're supposed to be looking out for predators. Like, like, maybe that's what they're for. Maybe people with ADHD evolved, we evolved them so they could stand at the front of the cave and wait for the saber tooth. You know, they hear a noise. What is that? Oh, 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 oh wait, wait. This is just a rabbit. <laughs> and that's what they're for, that they're supposed to do that so that nobody can get you. Um, I have to wonder if it's true. It makes, and, it makes sense. <laughs> I mean, like, you do, I, I, I do like that about evolutionary psychology, the idea of what is what we consider a problem today? How would it, how would it have been useful to us in the past of our species? And I think that's really, um, it's a lot, help, a lot more helpful and a lot more interesting than a lot of the prescriptive stuff that comes out of psychology. Yeah. And it's also the least popular part of psychology. And I mean, there's certain parts of it. Okay, maybe some parts of it were just like justifications for slavery or whatever. And that was bad, obviously. But but on the other hand, you know, there's things like parental investment theory. Which grandparent, if you have four grandparents, which of those four is most invested in your well-being? Evolutionary psychology says your mother's mother. Because she knows she gave birth to your mother. And she knows your mother gave birth to you. Your father can never be 100% sure you're his, and your father's father has even less reason. Your father's mother has a little more reason because she at least knows your father is hers. You know what I mean? So it's that straight maternal line that gets the most investment. It's kind of of hilarious that genetic information is actually better tracked through the X line anyway. So it's like, because everyone has one. So, like, you could track up from your mother and all the, like, back hundreds of years, supposedly, and, um, and know more than you could if you tried to track through your father's lineage. And that's why a lot of cultures uh, trace things maternally. Uh, in Jewish culture, a Jew is defined as someone whose mother was Jewish. Well, there's a reason for that. It's easier to track. Um, Kind of interesting. Uh, what to say? 
I mean, I don't want to end this now because we're finally getting something of an audience here. You know, we're up to like, uh, we, yeah, we got, I think, six people watching right now. We actually have a decent audience at this point. Um, by okay. the way, everybody, if you could, guys could click the like button, that would be great. Um, it, it makes me feel really good about myself because I see that the lo- number of likes is going up. And I'm like, yeah, someone actually enjoys what I do. It makes me really happy. Alex, what were you saying? I was going to say, maybe bring it back to the story. I wanted to know your opinion of the big reveal um, for the father that um, Tech told him, essentially showed that he'd been lying to himself for more than a dozen years about some pivotal moment. Oh, well, it's funny you should say that because I actually did have a thought about that when I saw it. (laughs) My thought was, um, I have this friend who I've been friends with since I was a child. And he and I have this time, he would have these, this thing that has happened several times to us. One of, I, he will come to me and go, hey, remember when you told me that blah, 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 blah? You know, he'll, he'll say something, and I'll go, wait, you told me that. And we just stare at each other for a moment. We go, okay, one of us told the other one that. We're not going to say who it was. Because we both know that memory is malleable, so the only thing we can agree on is one of us said that to the other one. <laughs> and that's a little bit more of an equitable solution. Like, okay, we each remember the other one saying that to us. Let's just let's just have a ceasefire bury the hatchet one of us said that you know and and if it's a bad thing we're both like okay on condition that i actually said it you have my apology and and that's it and and it actually works because um he he has uh in in the myers-briggs system your letters of course so does everybody i've been friends with my entire life it's so weird uh I so I, go ahead. I have a very, very um, strong memory for verbal communication. Sometimes I can remember exact exchanges years after they happen. Um, it's because of my learning disability. They taught me how to read and write and spell using my memory only. So I incredibly well trained it. So that includes the spoken word and the written word. And it makes it somewhat frustrating sometimes like i'm not gonna say it's perfect but sometimes i'm like i'm pretty damn sure (laughs) and and like it's happened with like uh working in business and stuff like oh i'm a customer and i'm like no 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 no. i know exactly what was said to me (laughs) and they're like maybe you misheard no (laughs) and like it gets frustrating so like to me i look at this video log thing and i go please (laughs) like not because i'm i like want to hold it over people but it can it can get really i i feel like it would be really helpful to people to communicate about the past and especially in stuff like oh i ordered this from this company and they didn't deliver or whatever you know in those kinds of situations i think it would be very helpful to have a an actual video of what happened. <laughs> it's funny you should say that. Um, I, I was going to say, I didn't want to say this because I never like to sound like I'm bragging, but then when you said it, it didn't sound like you were bragging, so I think it's okay for me to say it. Um, I also, I have a very good memory. Uh, you know, at, at certain points in my friend groups, my nickname has been Rain Man. <laughs> Because I say to my friend, I said to my friend, hey, remember when we were in middle school? We're both in our 30s. Remember when we were in middle school and we had MySpaces and you had the song Into Battle by Enciferum on your MySpace? And then I left the lyrics of it as a comment and you said, oh, wait, I was listening to that song right when I read that. But then again, I'm usually listening to that song when I'm on here. And the guy just stares at me for a little bit and goes like, are you a computer? <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, and, and I've done this. And the thing is, I know I'm not fooling myself because I've had times where I've tested it. I've thought, OK, this thing hasn't happened in I, or I haven't even looked in this place for X amount of years. What do I remember? And I'll say it out loud to myself and then look. And I'm usually right. I, I have a very good, very precise memory. I can't remember where I left my fucking car keys. But I can remember something you said when we were 10. (laughs) Yeah, that is true. It's not about finding things. That would be actually really handy and not 
not slightly torturous. Um, but <laughs> I didn't know about it until I was in grad school, and like we were talking about so the literature we're reading, and I go, I start quoting actual parts of it, you know, just like, oh yeah, that part, and I like just like line by line pull it out of my head, and they go, your memory is insane. And I was like, I even know what, what, you know, part of the page it was on. <laughs> and, I, and, and I didn't know that was a big deal, like, until grad school, that my memory was that good. And I did, like, there was one point where, to my best friend, I quoted... Is that a, because so it wasn't until grad school when you actually started talking to people? <laughs> <laughs> It's not until I started talking to people who read a lot, you know, uh, and we were specifically talking about books. But once a friend uh, had quoted uh, Hemingway and Faulkner at me uh, about this exchange that they had, where Faulkner says, oh, poor Hemingway, uh, never used a word that sent a reader to the dictionary. And Hemingway clapped back and said that Faulkner believes that big emotions reside in big words and <laughs> there are older and better words and it was so funny because like he said that quote to me two years later i was like wow that you remember that quote you gave to me and i i repeated it back to him and he goes i said that to you i don't even remember those quotes <laughs> I, I memorized the poem The Conqueror Worm by Edgar Allan Poe when I was 12. It's the first poem I ever memorized. Okay, hang on. I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm going to try it. Um, it's been years since I... I used to quote it for people and listen to them ooh and ah over it as a teenager. Let me see if I can do the whole thing. Um... Good grief. Now, now uh, poetry embarrasses me in a weird way. It's sort of like if you're singing rather than talking to people, singing, if you mess up while singing, it's relatively much more embarrassing than if you mess up while talking. Messing, uh, you know, poetry is much more vulnerable than prose for an analogous reason. Does that make any sense? Even if it's not your own poetry, but I'm going to try it. Um, Lo, tis a gala night within the lonesome latter years. An angel throng, bewinged, bedight, in veils and drowned in tears, sits in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra plays fitfully the music of the spheres. Mimes in the form of God on high mutter and mumble low, and hither and thither fly mere puppets they who come and go at bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings invisible woe. That motley drama, oh be sure, it shall not be forgot. Its phantom chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not, through a circle that ever returneth into the selfsame spot, and much of madness and more of sin in horror the soul of the plot. But see amid the mimic rout a crawling shape intrude, a blood-red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes with mortal pangs, the mimes become its food, and seraphs sob at human, at vermin fangs in human gore imbued. Out, out are the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm, while the angels all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm, that play is the tragedy man, and its hero the conqueror worm. Holy shit. <laughs> You're drinking. <laughs> Well, that's why the the drinking is why I'm quoting poetry I memorized so long ago. Normally, that would be so cringe inducing. I'd be like, Caleb, dude, don't do that on the internet in front of strangers. But when I'm, you know, that meme that's like, I'm not going to do this, and then it's like three drinks later, <laughs> I'm not going to quote any p poetry. Three drinks later, lo, tis a gala night. You know, <laughs> I do that's me. think uh, you do have a good memory, not just because you, as you just demonstrated. But because you pull out quotes regularly uh, from authors you've read and from philosophy, so I don't, I don't, I like, I would say you have a really good memory. Thank you. Somebody once told me that I'm a gumball machine of quotes. <laughs> that you, you just, you just like tap on it, and out comes a quotation. 
I think that's really amazing. I've never taken the time to do it. Like, honestly, like, I, I've never really been focused on doing it. I really, uh, most of my memory goes towards uh, verbal exchanges and memorizing those. I don't know why. It's it's what I naturally want to retain, apparently. And I, maybe because I don't have a lot of conversations. <laughs> It could be, but I mean, like, if you're if you're verbally tilted, I, I, I think that we undervalue verbal reasoning because right now IT is huge and STEM is huge, but that won't last forever. Um, this might interest you to know: in the 19th century in Germany, music was valued over every other field. Nietzsche was a was a philologist by vocation, and a philosopher by, avoca by avocation. But he always felt ashamed that he wasn't a musician, because that's what everybody wanted to be. Because this was the 1800s, in late 1800s, Beethoven had come in the early 1800s, and everybody was like, hell yes, Beethoven, everybody should be a composer, that's the best thing you can be. Because everybody was just like starstruck by the fact that Beethoven had just been alive. And... I, I mean, I, I, it's kind of hard to argue with them if you listen to the history of German classical music and listen to Beethoven. It's like, well, fuck, what else is there left to do now? You listen to all of his symphonies, you're like, I can't write music. He, he did everything. They what am I going to say? They literally made CDs uh, be able to hold enough data to put his symphonies on it. Like, in, they were like, and that was at the suggestion of a guy named Herbert von Karajan, or Karajan. Mm -hmm who was a conductor, uh, who insisted that CDs be that long. I, when I first learned that about CDs, I was like, that's actually incredibly cool. Uh, because, yeah, it would be really annoying to break up Beethoven's symphonies. Like, we grew up pretty much with CDs. So, like, it was already, like, within our reach. But the idea that it would be not available to you to listen, you know, at home or whatever. That sounds, like, really awful. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. And, like, but one thing, one thing, reason I think it's really cool is because we kind of decided as a culture, like, yeah, CDs are going to hold this much because Beethoven is really cool and we have to have his whole symphony on one. And part of it, part of it is a trollish impulse in me that I want to own the libs. Like, yeah, go ahead and bitch about the dead white male CDs are this long so it can hold this symphony, eat shit. Um, and I mean, I don't know, yeah, I, I feel like Beethoven, if Beethoven would probably approve, and if he wouldn't, Wagner definitely would. <laughs> you know, I, I've often thought that, like, maybe I could go by a modern art exhibit or something of that nature and maybe troll them by having a giant set of speakers blaring Wagner. You know, you're playing Ride of the Valkyries. Not Beethoven. You know, Beethoven might be more acceptable on that front because, oh, Western civilization. But then you've got Wagner, who, as a person, would have approved of that kind of thing. He'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, good idea. What's hilarious is you mentioning that made me think there's an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm where he's whistling. Oh, you're a self-loathing Jew! <laughs> yeah! That was hilarious! And I loved his, the way he was like, well, screw it, it's good music, I'm gonna keep freaking whistling it. And I was like, yeah, you should! <laughs> My favorite part is where he's like, yeah, you know what, I do hate myself, but it's not because I'm Jewish. Because the guy called him a self-loathing Jew, he's like, yeah, I kind of do hate myself, but not because I'm Jewish, okay? So... That show is Literally hard to watch, him. though, because yes. it's so anxiety-inducing. You know the train wreck is coming, and you don't want to watch it. <laughs> but then there's that one episode that's really heartwarming with the guy with Tourette's. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, I love that episode, where he's the chef in the open kitchen. <laughs> and he starts swearing, and, and he's, he's suddenly like this, like, oh no, they're all going to come down on me. And then everybody joins in. Yeah, I, I thought that was, that was actually really sweet. That, that one turned out really nice. Yeah. 
You okay? Yeah, sorry. I know I have a very expressive face and it verges on insane to a lot of people. <laughs> it just looks like you're going through a lot in your head right now and I have no verbal clue as to what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, if, if you ever, in, if anybody ever introduces me to their friends, one thing that you're going to deal with is as soon as I leave the room, your friends are going to look at you like this, trying to look nice and go, so what's his deal? And you're going to have to go, he's Caleb. <laughs> it, it, it's just, it's Caleb. Just, just, just don't question it. <laughs> So, actually, so I want to say hi to Patrick Barnes. Uh, he watched the Anarchist Handbook Book Club on uh, Sunday, and I was on that. And uh -huh. uh, then he checked out my channel, and there's no, like, philosophizing on my channel, really. It's almost all uh, gaming uh, live streams. Uh, and I told him, I was like, if you really want to see this kind of content, uh, you can watch it on Caleb Beer's channel. <laughs> well, I mean, I appreciate it. It's nice that somebody uh, thinks this stuff is important and goes through it and listens to it and, uh, you know, kind of vibes with us. It, it, it's, it, you know, it makes me really happy that somebody cares that much. I mean, uh, I think people are more more open to the idea of conversations now, like really interesting conversations. Like, I don't, I don't, I think a lot of people are tired of the format of we're going to tell you a bunch of information, <laughs> you know, or I'm going to bitch for an hour. <laughs> Well, because that's easy to find, you know, in the information age, any factual information you want, any sort of instruction or diagnostic manual can be easily be found with a quick Googling. What cannot be found is spontaneity. Where do you get that? From conversation. I know. I, I, my podcast is coming out soon. And, um, and, and that's going to be on the Unsafe Space channel. And I'm very excited for it because it is kind of like this, only recorded, because I, uh, I don't have the time for another live stream. <laughs> but, uh, and also because I really wanted to, um, but it still has the spontaneity to it because it's still a conversation between two people who didn't plan out what they were going to say. You know, we're coming at each other with, you know, our own personalities and, um, it's, It'll be interesting. <laughs> Indeed. Sorry, I, I, I know. I, I know watching my face is like watching an aquarium with fish that are talking to each other, but you can't tell what they're saying. You think that's bad? I mean, like, it took me years and years and years, maybe until like my late 20s even, before I could stop talking to myself in public. It was bad. It's because the reason is, is that like, I have to construct an imaginary person and then dialogue with them, like having a pu it's almost like having a puppet show where you're talking to the puppet. And yes, you're controlling the puppet, but it helps kind of externalize your thoughts. And, and there are places where people use this professionally. In fact, there's a thing called rubber ducky debugging that a lot of software developers use, where if you need to debug your software and you can't figure out what's wrong, you put a rubber ducky on your desk and you explain to the rubber ducky what's wrong. And people find that when they do this, all of a sudden they're OK. They, all of a sudden, they can figure out what the problem is because they verbalize it. The way that I plan the conversations and such for my novels is weird. Because, I mean, a lot of the conversations between characters in my fiction have taken place with me doing, like, a Jekyll and Hyde routine while I'm alone. Like, I even do the facial expressions and everything, and I'm like, you no, know, it gets worse. It gets worse. 
I'm pacing around in circles the whole time, wandering through my house, going like, like, like having this conversation between two people. If someone could see me, they would think I was fucking crazy. <laughs> Writers always but, but, do weird things. It's normal. <laughs> I was going to say, it, it, this is why I need to become a published writer or at least make a lot of money, because if I make enough money, I can say I'm eccentric and not just a lunatic. <laughs> I, it's kind I, of funny. I would think that me, with my playwriting experience, would be the one to do that, and, I, and I'm not. But you can tell from the dialogue <laughs> of my characters that I have a lot of playwriting experience, um, because that's mostly what writing a play is, is... Um, getting people to talk around the subject. Uh, <laughs> have you, have your plays been performed at all? Yes, actually. Um, there's are there videos? Uh, no, there are no videos available because um, that's technically um, copyright infringement <laughs> of my work. Um, because you can't... Do you have videos? I don't have videos, unfortunately. Um, I have... So... It's called The Two Halves of Andrew's Brain. I published it when I was 18 years old. Um, and it was one of the finalists at the International Thespian Festival in 2005. Uh, and it gets performed at high schools. Uh, so, and, and it's, it's, it's weird. Like, if you've seen the movie Inside Out, I think people understand the concept. But this was obviously a very long time before Inside Out. It's where, like, different aspects of a person's brain are personified and they have a conversation and stuff. So, and it's a comedy. Uh, and uh, it's available on PlayScripts Incorporated. That's who publishes it and who you can buy uh, performances from. And um, it's not, uh, it, it's kind of dwindled in popularity over the years because it's been, like, 15 years. Uh, but like in the first five years, oh my god, it it went like gangbusters in the high school crowd. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never got to see a live performance of it. <laughs> oh, that sucks! Publish more plays, then. Why don't you do more? I have a bunch of plays written, uh, but most of them are more adult content. Um, I have one about the six wives of Henry the Eighth, which makes sense because I am kind of obsessed with the Tudor history, uh, and it's about the six of them in purgatory um it's like weird uh and i have a few comedies that i've written oh um actually on my website is um part of one of my one acts um called um filling the bathtub that one uh a lot of people really liked it it just never uh really got anywhere but it's just two people in a hotel room and it's a woman trying to um, hire him to kill her husband. I see. So, um... I know you say they're adult content. Have you ever thought maybe you could, uh... Oh, I don't know, boulderize them just enough to be performed by high school kids? Like, just make it... Because high school plays can get raunchier than you would think. They can get away with a lot, as long as it has a thin veneer. Because most people are so fucking stupid. I'm sorry. I think kind of running from fire, that's the one about the tutors, could, you know, the, the wives could probably be performed at a high school without a problem, because, you know, the language is a little different. You know, it's not quite so... Uh, um modern with its swear words <laughs> but uh filling the bathtub i'm not so sure on it's pretty uh harsh it's it's more like mf which is mm -hmm. short for motherfucker it's a that's a one act play that i actually directed at one point and it's it's <laughs> it's about a group of writing students uh who are writing fiction and one of them is good but what he's writing about is fucking his mother. <laughs> so it's, like, really disturbing. And now we have that whole Chris Chan fiasco spreading over the internet. You know what I'm talking about, Alex? Did yeah, you know about Chris Chan prior to this? That's yes. what I'm curious. I, I did. I've known about it 
uh, I think at least two weeks. And I think I knew about it in day two uh, of the story breaking, and it was just so disturbing. Oh. Well, I was into Chris Chan. Well, I make it sound like he's a fucking franchise. <laughs> I was into Chris Chan when I was a teenager because it's been going on that long. Like my friends and I discussed whether we would drive, make a road trip down to Virginia and troll his ass. <laughs> like we were talking about maybe trolling him and stuff. And, and and yeah, every few years I would check back in on him. And then I heard about this and I'm like, oh shit, he finally did it. I mean, Personally, I can't tell if he's just like a horrible person or just a person who is so damaged that he can't be held accountable for the things he does. I mean, he could be insane. I mean, that from the legal standpoint, uh, which means they can't. Well, insane right. is a legal term, not a medical one. Exactly. Um, I know people use it incorrectly. And now apparently it's problematic to use the word. And I'm like, it's a legal word. It means something very, very specific. You're being ridiculous about it. <laughs> oh, man. No, oh, jeez, man, I, it is. I don't think Go we ahead. should end it on Chris Chan. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say this. This, I, I when you start talking about Christian Weston motherfucking Chandler, it's probably time to cut things short. <laughs> so let's, um, Alex, do you have a closing statement that's not about Chris Chan? Okay, I do think people should read. This author's work, Ted Chiang, I think he's really um, dynamic and interesting, as opposed to just playing the political game that writing has become. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, I would say that people should read Ted Chiang, and I also think that you should go looking in the unlooked-for, uh, forbidding, strange, dark corners of the internet to find really edgy, really new avant-garde art. Don't look to the big publishers, because the supposed avant-garde that they publish is really garbage. It's really mainstream BS. Look in the places where no one looks. You know, look for those dark corners because that's where the real excitement is. That's all we have for now.